Hey, there we go. All oh, right. Sorry. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Can it, can you guys hear me? Does someone mind throwing something in the chat just saying you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, well, welcome today. Um, we really appreciate you jumping on. We've had several people express interest. I'm sure there will be several that will join as we go. Um, but we'll jump in and get started. We're going to record the session today and um, post it and we can share it if there's things that People, if you want to share it with others or if there's other questions or whatnot, we'll create a little uh, format for people to do that. Is there, is it recording? Okay, it's already recording. Uh, my name is Todd Nuttall. I'm the president and chief operating officer of Vicious RV. We're a small little RV company in uh, based out of Boise, Idaho. We've got a number of locations all the way from uh, Oregon to Richmond, Virginia. We have 21 locations and just announced that we'll be adding um, a dealership in Traverse City in April. So we're pretty excited about that. That'll be 22 locations. I'll jump in a little bit to Bish's, but really the purpose of today is to um, spend a little bit of time with you to hopefully get you guys thinking and uh, inspire you a little bit. So that's a that's a bold task for me. I'm no Tony Robbins, so we'll do our best here. Um, I'm trying to figure out our technology. I'm going to just see it. Oh, hey, there we go. It's working. Okay. So <clears throat> We really want to get you thinking about what you want out of your career. I've been in the career environment now since 2007. And um, a lot of this was collaboration between several leaders on our team, thinking back to when we were in your seat in college or just graduating college and kind of some things we wish some people would have told us. And I think there's a lot of things that are told to you in college, whether it be from parents, from professors, from friends. And uh, we want to offer you another perspective today that might be a little different than what you've heard other places. It might be the same. We don't know. But hopefully as a result of it, it inspires you to really search out what you want in a career opportunity and help you achieve it. Um, so the nature of the way we are, we're a pretty collaborative groups. So we're going to invite you to participate as we go along. So hopefully you'll have some fun. If you have questions at any time, please raise your hand, um, throw it in the chat. And uh, we can collaborate that way too. There's a lot of people on the call. And so we won't, we'll keep it muted, but certainly if there's good uh, questions and maybe some collaboration, we'll invite you to share. We do welcome, I see Sean on the screen. We got a, a live person there. So we welcome you to throw yourself on camera if you're willing to. We're cool if you're in pajamas, no big deal here. Uh, a lot of our guys wear that to work. So, um, Oops, I'm, I'm moving too fast here. So <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about getting an ROI out of your college degree. So I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here, uh, and it's going to have a little QR reader. If you'll scan this QR reader, and we'd like your participation here. So it's going to open up VVox on your phone or your uh, whatever you got there. Just scan that reader, and if you would, take a second and answer what are the top three reasons based on these answers that you're attending college right now? So take a minute, we can see eight people logged into it as that grows. We'll give it just a couple minutes here for people to answer their top three. It'll let you select more than three, but just choose the top three for sake of time. While you guys are filling that out, I see a couple of our team leaders. I see James Packer. Tell you a little bit about James. He's been featured on Men's Mustache Magazine. Look at that. He is looking good, too. MMM, that's what that magazine's called. Look it up. <laughs> Only for you, Todd. Only for you. So not, not really, but I just realized that... Uh, my speakers went off. Hey, James, take yourself on mute for a minute. And say hi. I got to see if my speaker's working. Hey, what's up, guys? 
There you go. Cool. Thanks, man. <clears throat> okay, we got we got 22 people. I'm going to close the poll in a second. So go ahead and get your final answers in. Here we go. Let's see what we find out. All right. Number one answer. Is that me? Okay, the number one answer here is to earn more money in my future career. Number two is to study a subject I'm passionate about. Number three is to gain independence and freedom. Pretty cool. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story that, that happened. I don't know why. It's, can you guys, James, do you hear that little beeping noise? Yeah, it's sort of a chime. I don't know. Is that coming from somebody's, uh, somebody's computer? I, I'm hearing it, but it's faint in the background. Okay. May, maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe it's mine, but I don't know how or why. Okay. Um, so we, we do some uh, recruiting at different colleges. Some of you may have seen us on your campus. Um, some of you probably haven't, but what's interesting is that several of our colleges actually train their students not to ask about money with potential career um, opportunities. I don't know if you've heard that before or not, but I had one guy that heads up a recruiting office for one of the major universities call me and apologize because of, um, he, he, he called and apologized because he found out a couple of his students had asked about the earning opportunity of, of Bish's RV. And, um, and he says, that's super disrespectful. We train our kids not to do that. And I'm like, whoa, I, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. Like, it's the number one reason that most people are in college is to, to earn more money in their future career. They're investing in themselves. And as you consider your career opportunity, that's a very important criteria. And so I think that's important. We're going to get into a little bit of that today. But we want you to be able to get a good ROI on your college investment. We all went through the same process you did, and we ended up in an RV company. And let's face it, when you're talking amongst your peers or you're talking to your parents or to your, your, your um, friends at school, you're not saying, hey, you know what? I'm getting this degree. Hopefully, I can go on and be an RV person. And I want to work on an RV lot. Uh, that's not really what people in college are thinking that they're going to jump into. Um, but what we've been able to help people realize it's a great opportunity um, for the right people. It's not for everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going I'm to do one more little question here. Actually, I've got a few of them, but I'm going to jump to the next one. So this one's similar, but a little different. How do I get there? There we go. So go ahead on this one. If you haven't, if you haven't scanned the QR code, go ahead and scan that QR code. This one's really important. What is most important to you as you're choosing a career? So we've listed a few things. Select the top three in your order of importance. And as you're as you're thinking through that, um, and as you're answering that, I want you guys to, <clears throat> to think about, hopefully you've had a minute to really think through this as your own individual life, what, what you're hoping to get from a career. Uh, you're in one of the most, I think, exciting times of life as you're making this decision. You have a lot of options. You, you don't necessarily have a lot of risk in the positions that you're in. You got the whole world in front of you and it's a pretty exciting world. There's, I mean, heck, OpenAI chat just came out and is changing things at a faster pace than I've ever seen. There's just a lot of cool things going on. And you guys are at the front of that. You're going to be at the helm. So that's pretty exciting. If you're just joining us, with which a few of you have, feel free to scan this, uh, this QR code. And you're answering the top three most important things to you as you're choosing your career. I see a few more people on there. I see Holden Green. What's up, Holden? And Jasmine Jackson. Hey. And Logan Morris. Look at Logan there. Logan works for us. He's the director of our analytics. He's pretty awesome. It looks like he's even got one of his littles with him. 
We'll give it just a second here. The more answers, the, the more representative of our group here. This is cool. Zoom is cool. This whole technology, you guys, first part of my career, we spent a lot of time traveling. I spent a lot of time traveling. And it's amazing how much travel can be replaced and how I can be in so many locations in a day now. And different. It's pretty cool. Um, okay. I'm going to close it up. If you haven't got your answers in, I'll give you one more minute to get up, jump them in there. What's most important, total income or benef and benefits, the work-life balance, job stability, career growth, a winning culture, again, obtaining a field in my degree, cool perks, making an immediate impact, being a decision maker or something else. All right, we're going to close it up. Boom. Total income and benefits work-life balance, career growth and development, job stability, a field in my degree, decision maker, cool perks. Awesome. Very good. Um, so again, I, I think it reiterates a point, right? You guys went to college so that you could get a good paying job coming out. That's an important thing. And we can't, Again, we can't be quiet about that. That's important. Work-life balance, um, being able to have a life outside of work. I think that's important. Career growth and development and leadership opportunities. At our company, we call this the big three. We've done this survey with thousands, thousands of different college students. And we typically lump work-life balance into culture. It's part of the culture of a company. Um, and you know, we separated and had a winning culture and work-life balance. Um, and it, it helped us see some things today. So we call this the big three, but, but right now, whatever yours were, just because it may not align with what the total outcome is, it's still your big three. And I think it's important to realize that. Remember your big three. This is the reason that you're in college. It's part of your return on investment. When you're, when you're interviewing and you're considering different options for careers, it's really important to weigh your consideration. Um, when I came out of college, I wish somebody would have told me the effort that the company goes through and the strategy behind interviewing every single candidate. I have literally in my career spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours studying, researching, and evaluating interview methods, case studies, understanding how to help see how people think and what, how, they, how they solve problems. Um, so that when we're interviewing and selecting candidates, we can do our best to bring people in that fit our mold and will help us achieve what we want to achieve. But whenever you go, or whenever I did, I can't say what you've gone through, but whenever I would go and learn what I should be doing inside of an interview, they would coach me on how to respond and how to interview better. How do I make myself shine in front of whoever's interviewing me? So that's great, but who's trained you on how to interview them? Right, these big three, if I were in your seat, I would take the time to know my big three and I would start understanding what questions I need to ask that help me understand if this company is in line with my big three. And I don't care how narrow the job field is. Every candidate has the right and, the, and almost the obligation for yourself and your future self to dedicate yourself to studying out how do I interview companies? And hopefully maybe some of you have, and maybe there's some, some uh, training on that, but <clears throat> this big three is important because it's your big three. Um, whoop, there we go. So I told you at Bish is we've identified by interviewing thousands of different candidates, talking to several different people in your situation that really their big three almost always falls into three buckets, income, growth, and the work culture. What's the environment? What's my work-life balance? Who am I associating with? Is it a high energy, high octane? Is it laid back and really chill? What's the culture? What's the environment like? So we're gonna dive into these just for a minute. And I'm gonna go into each one of these. Again, if you have questions or you're just joining us, thank you for joining. If you have questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. 
And um, we'll we'll look at those. And if there's things that are relevant, we'll even stop midstream to kind of hit some of them. Um, <clears throat> hey, James, do you mind kind of moderating the chat? And if you see something, just ping us and say, hey, we got to hit this one. It's kind of hard. To yeah, see. no problem. Okay. Yeah, so, we'll do. So we're going to break the rule. We're going to be the ones that start it. We're going to break the rule. And we're going to talk about money. Um, so to start out with, I'm going to throw this back on and I'm going to ask you guys another question. I read a very interesting article the other day. And so we're going to find out if it bears true. Um, so here we go. If you're still in on your thing, you'll see it. If you haven't, scan the code here, jump in. What do you expect your income to be year one out of college? We'll set a timer. I didn't know you could do this. This is cool. We'll set a one minute timer. Boom. Probably don't need a minute. Look how fast y'all are. Hey, if you don't know what we're doing, go ahead and uh, scan that code on your screen with your phone. Jump in and throw your your uh, your numbers out there. No, none of us know who does anything. It's totally anonymous, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see kind of what everyone's expectations are and see where you line out. All right, we got 26 out of 27. I'm going to I'm going to hold it or close it. All right. 7.4 says 35 to 45, 22% 45 to 60, 37% said 60 to 80, 11% said 85 to 100, 11% said 100 to 125, 11% say over 125. Um a study across America with thousands of students indicated that the average college student coming out of college expects to make around $103,000. Um, what's interesting about that is that the actual average in 2023 is projected to be 55260 um, Now, I don't know everybody's degrees and what you guys have studied, and there are variances between fields of study and um, my purpose today is to help you figure out how to get what you're expecting or more than what you're expecting. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you another question here and uh, we won't do a ton more of these, but it, you'll see how it all ties together here in a second. So real quick, still got 18 of you live on there. So jump on this one. So now you've been out of college for 10 years. You're in the work field, you've established yourself. Now, what do you think your income will or should be? We'll go 30 seconds. I don't think we need a minute. Ah, oh, crap. <laughs> there we go. Oh, 26 out of 26. We're done. You guys are fast. You've, you've thought about this one. Check it out. <clears throat> okay. Interesting. So this spread is a little bigger on the bigger ends here. So about 27% lead out at 100 to 150, 23% 150 to 200, 19 say 200 to 250, and 250 say 23% or 23% say 250 or more. Um, when I went, I, 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 when I started attending different colleges, we threw up a screen that said we took some average income of some of our top general managers in our dealerships and showed what they could make. And the feedback the first time we did it, it was over $450,000 a year. And when we put it up on there, we, to us, it was like, this is real. To the students, they almost looked at it and ran and said, whoa, that seems too, too good to be true. Or that just doesn't even seem like a real opportunity. And we didn't realize that throwing those numbers out could scare people. And, and as we learned with the students, we kind of narrowed some of that approach. But one of the challenges that we have is, is as a company, our strategy is a little different and we pay top management like owners of the company in several ways. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But 
our the, the title of today's session is set your sights higher. And we want to encourage people that if you have aspirations and money is one of your top criteria, which we know it is, set your sights high. Shoot for, shoot for those numbers. And we're going to talk to you from a basis of what we know and what we've experienced. And it may or may not line out with everything else that's out there, but it's one piece of the puzzle that you can throw into your, your set to understand some options that you might have. Um, Is it not moving? Sorry here, trying to get my screen to move. There we go. Whoa. There we go. Okay. So the expected earnings, I mentioned that. Here's the actual stats. Average salary is around 55,260. So you know the expectations. So in this study I read, the average person thought that they would make $103,000 coming out of college, yet the average salary is between 55 to 260. Um, in one to four years, the annual average increase is 7%, which would be 59,000. In five to nine years, the average increase is 42%, up to 78. And in 10 years, it's 72% at 95,000. So when I graduated college, I, I got a marketing and finance degree um, out of University of Utah. And I was convinced that I needed to work in a corporate America, spend two to three years to get my MBA. And that was my path to $100,000 a year and more. I'm a little older, um, cost of living is a little less than, but that, that was my objective. And that's what I thought I needed to do because that was kind of the groundwork that was laid to me from family, from the school and what was going on. Um, and while I think it's a noble cause and it's, it's effort, there are opportunities out there that don't necessarily hit the radar of probably 90% of college students. Um, they might be a little more entrepreneurial related. They might be a little bit more um, aggressive or uh, entrepreneurial is probably the best word for it, but they're out there. Um, and these are things, again, that I wish I would have known a little bit more about. But one of those is risk and reward. So of top earning executives, 75% of their income comes from variable rate pay. Uh, variable rate, to define that, is it's a percentage of return from an area or areas of the business that are impacted directly by their performance. So a CEO, they're getting paid off of, say, the bottom line of their company, probably have some stock options. Those are variable rates. When I graduated college, I had a couple of different offers. I had actually accepted an offer at Ford in Detroit to go work in their finance rotation program. So I was headed to Dearborn, Michigan. And <clears throat> the opportunity was a stable, good opportunity, great career progression potentially and growth in a very, very mature company. I have several friends who went that route. Three years later, they're asking me, what, did, what are you doing? And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm in the RV industry <laughs> of all places. I'm, I'm out selling trailers. That's what I'm doing. I'm selling trailers and slinging trailers and running RV dealerships. And the opportunities that I had were totally different financially than what they had. So they're sitting in a cubicle. They've got this 10 year, 15, 20 year progression of growth that what could take two months in the RV industry of growth or what would take you to progress or promote in two or three years might take 10 to 15 in a place like Ford. So I have several friends that have followed the path below, and I will tell you this, I think that most of them were far smarter and just as, if not more capable than I was, but I took a different path, and it's a path that none of them ever had even considered. Um, when we get into, when we talk to a lot of college students, I'm a, we talk about variable rate. Or when you're looking at job opportunities and potential career opportunities, you probably see things like equity. Well, we can't give you the salary that you want, but we're, we just started this, this opportunity that's in our garage and we'll give you a piece of the company. That's variable rate pay. High risk, high return. Stock options, same thing. Look, if you're working at a certain company, maybe they're early on in there. If you get stock options, you know as that company grows, high, high risk high return, maybe less guaranteed rate, but higher variable rate, bonuses, 
um, tied to maybe some key performance indicators. Commissions. This is a word that scares a lot of people. Um, we have positions, myself included. I'm, I work on zero, zero salary. I am 100% commission. Um, coming out of college, we don't have people start at 100% commission. But after a few years in the company, people hopefully work towards that type of a rate because they know what they can create on that type of a, an incentive plan. The other, you may have heard of piece rate. This is very common in the trades where in manufacturing, the more you produce, the more you get paid. Maybe it's a dollar for every widget that's created or something like that. Um, but when you go home and you tell your parents, hey, I got this opportunity in the RV industry or whatever industry. And here's the thing, though. It's about 75% variable for me to hit what I think I could hit. That's the look on your mom's face, right? That's the look on potentially your, your professor's face. That's the look on my mom's face when I told her what I was doing. What? The RV industry? You went to college for what? Right? Actually, my mom didn't because my dad was in the industry. So that's kind of why kind of started there. But um, this is common. When we recruit, we actually offer to meet with parents and help them realize their kids aren't choosing the bad path and educate them a little bit on the process because you have to understand the opportunity in its entirety. <laughs> you mentioned growth. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of uh, Cheryl Sandberg. She was the, she worked for Facebook. I'm gonna ask you another question and then I'm gonna use Cheryl Sandberg as an example. It's a really, really cool story. Um, so real quick, choose this. Put 30 seconds on the clock, scan in here. <clears throat> Which option suits you better? If you were offered a guaranteed salary of 60,000 a year, right out of college, or a guaranteed salary of 45,000, but you also had a bonus potential of 60,000 total. That's a total opportunity of 105. What would you choose? No answer is wrong. This is one of those things as you're identifying your big three, this is something that you have to consider. It's an evaluation tool. Five seconds, here we go. Boom, boom, boom. Nice. 82% of you say that you would take the opportunity less salary with more bonus potential uh, versus 17.6 that would take 60,000. So we have what we call here an anomaly versus the average. So you guys are on the higher end of the average. The probably the biggest limiter of someone's career growth or of their pay is are they willing to accept some risk to generate a bigger opportunity? Are they willing to bet on themselves? And that bet doesn't have to be uncalculated. There are certain there are certain opportunities. Maybe you've been exposed to these. I was in college where I'd sit down with them and you're maybe selling knives door to door or whatever, and it's all commission and you got to sell every friend and family that you have to get to where you want to be. And some people can do it really, really well. It's a great opportunity for them. But you get to choose. You can look at each eval and evaluate each opportunity. Um, some companies that have a, a variable uh, component that's maybe pretty high offer an immense amount of development and training and support and guidance and coaching that... If you're willing to put in the time and effort, you can generate the results. Um, so Cheryl Sandberg, I don't know why it does this. There we go. If we looked at this, oh, I gotta do one more question here, sorry. This is my last question, so indulge me one more time. Cheryl Sandberg, this was her situation, and I want you to put yourself in her shoes. Would you rather join Google in 2001 or join Google today? You're making a career choice and you have an opportunity to start with Google at the size and frame that it was in 2001 versus what Google is today. It's a giant. Yeah, we're going to close the poll. Thank you, guys. 89.96% of you <clears throat> it said 2001. So think about that for a second. Why, why did we say that? Somebody throw in the chat. Why did you say 2001? 
Why would you rather have started with Google in 2001? And James, uh, oh, Varun, I hope I said that right. Uh, Varun, Joseph, the, the answer to your question is yes, we do have programs aimed at grad students. Austin Track says growth opportunity. Jennifer Scott says smaller and more room for growth. Um, more growth. You guys will see those chat answers come in, but check this out. In 2002, this is the revenue of Google from 2002 to 2021. If you came in on a variable rate tied to their stock and you were able to get in in 2002 and have $32,000 worth of stock in Google, that's over. That's worth a million dollars today. Right? That's a heck of a return. Um, Cheryl Sandberg rode this train. So I don't know if you know who she is. If you if you haven't or if you don't, she wrote a book called Lean In. Um, it's a very good book, and there's a section of it that I love. <clears throat> but she was she was evaluating different career opportunities, and while she was evaluating the different career opportunities that she had, she was leaving the government sector in Washington D.C. She graduated from Harvard. She uh, was in the, in the government sector, decided she was going to go to the private sector and wanted to get into the technology space. She saw it as a bulging industry and knew that there was a lot of opportunity there. So she went to California and she had a friend named Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO uh, at the time of Google. This was back in the early 2000s. So Eric Schmidt is leading the company. I think it's around 2001 that she got into the company. So in 2001, she's evaluating these career opportunities. And she meets with Eric in their garage, and he starts telling the vision of Google and how they're going to change the world with how information is gathered and how people are able to access information. And he had this amazing mission, and it just sucked her in. She loved everything about it. And, and so she started to digest it, and then she said, wait, wait, the practical side of me says I need to do like a, a T-chart, right, the pros and cons. And then she started meeting with several other companies and had multiple different opportunities and offers. And she decided to make a spreadsheet on, on the left-hand side, she was listing the companies and then she would have all these different pros and cons and evaluate, it, evaluate the company. So she decided to take a very tactical approach, very pragmatic approach to figuring out which opportunity was best for her. And she said, as she went through the selection criteria, there was this one company, Google, that had offered her a job as get this as a title, business unit general manager. But here's the catch. They had no business units at this point, none. And all the other jobs she had opportunities, she was offered CEO, COO, big titles, big positions. So, but she really, really was sucked in by Google's plant, their mission. There was something about it. So she said she was compelled. She went back to Eric Schmidt and she said, hey, look, she was actually friends with him for a while before, but she said, look, Eric, I love everything that you're doing. Let me show you my evaluation tool. And she takes her little spreadsheet. She says, Eric, check this out. And she's looking at a listing and showing him all the opportunities. And as she did, Eric took his hand and covered up the screen and said, Cheryl, don't be an idiot. And she said that was her first piece of really good advice in life. But she, he said, don't be an idiot. When you have an opportunity to take, get on a, on a rocket ship, don't worry about what seat you're in. Just get on. This company is going somewhere. And she said the best, the best advice that propelled her career the most is that when you have an opportunity to get in with a big growing company, someone that's got their sights high, that that growth will propel so many opportunities that are unseen at the moment. Cheryl went on to lead a huge aspect of their company, and you see the growth. And then has furthered that, went to work for Facebook and has done a lot of other things. So <clears throat> growth is a very, very big thing, but catching a company at the right time and understanding what growth means. If you're part of a growing company, at a growing company, guys, it's chaotic. There's a lot of change. It's fast paced. There's a lot of fluidity where things structured one way today and another way three months from now. Our company, for example, and I started with Bishes in 2009, we had three business, four business units, we closed one. And then as of today, we will open our 22nd location um, in April. So over a very quick period of time, we've, we've more than tripled, quadrupled, we just, we're growing. And, and it's not because we're that, that special. 
I'm going to show you in a minute our, our industry and the opportunity that exists. But as you're evaluating, if growth is on your radar, I would consider timing. What is the timing of the company that you're looking at? What is their growth trajectory? If you want to grow as an individual and be promoted and take on more and more opportunities, if you join a very mature company, they still have opportunity for growth. But typically, on average, the timing of promotion is a lot farther delayed as there's a lot of maturity at the senior levels and a lot less turnover. It gets a little bit stagnant and bottlenecked. In a company like ours and several others out there that are young and are growing and are expanding quickly, there's a lot of opportunity that comes very quickly. So timing is a big part of growth. Highly recommend that book, by the way. The last thing- So is Todd- Go ahead. Sorry, you got a question here in the chat. And I think um, you said 2009 is when you joined, but you meant 19, right? 2019, sorry, yes. I got it. So within- What's that? Sorry, no, I was just gonna say, yeah, the growth is different there from 19 to to now to grow from four locations to, to 22 is, is uh, impressive, big growth. Good catch. Thank you guys for not leaving after that. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a question in the chat. Um, let's see here. Sorry. Uh, what was the business like during COVID? Good question. Uh, COVID was crazy. In March of 2020, our, our traffic into our stores dropped by 90% in the course of like two days when the world shut down, right? And our March, that, la that full month of March was just torture. We, um, however, by April, um, things started to pick up and in by, I mean, all the way through the last couple of years, it's been insane. Record gross explosion. What's really cool about that is we were worried like people are going to get into the industry and then say, ah, I don't really like this. And there's been some of that, but primarily we're seeing people now trade, get into something bigger, nicer, better, People love the RV industry, but uh, double digit growth every year. Now this year, supply has finally caught up with demand and has actually outpaced demand. So we're seeing it taper off a little bit. The prices of RVs grew on new RVs went up by 40 or 65% on average. So we saw that you know, if inflation is 10%, we're at like 65% on RVs. And so we're dealing with some of that right now. And consumers are kind of like, ah, I don't know if I want to spend that much. I think prices are going to come down, time it right. And so we're seeing an adjustment. But we're still projected to see, I can't say numbers right now because I'm going to give away $500 and I'm going to have you guys guess something and I, I can't give away the number. But I will tell you, it's been great growth and there's still a really, really healthy, healthy market. Good question. Um, okay, culture, you guys talked about quality of life, the work-life balance. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, I think the environment that you put yourself in and the people you surround yourself with is critical. We do a lot of acquisitions and an acquisition means we go out and buy another RV dealership. And our strategy is a little different than on some of the other consolidators in our industry. The other consolidators oftentimes are looking for a company that's already producing at a certain level so they could just buy them, add them to their portfolio and go buy the next one. We're different. We're RV operators. I've been in the RV industry since 2007. Um, we've been able to see dealerships go from selling 400 RVs to 2000 RVs in the same location. Uh, you see a guy on the call right now, his name is Jake Rasmussen. If you look, he's got headphones on. He saw that dealership all the way through, took it from one of the worst dealerships in the network to the very best. Um, and that, that type of operational success, we've been able to help translate that into other stores. So we go out and strategically look for dealers that are underperforming. We purchase them, and then we quickly transform them and, and gain an ROI. That's our strategy because we have some of that excellency in, in, our, in our strategy. However, it requires a certain amount of personnel. It's really hard to walk into a dealership and take the same group of people and say, okay, you've been selling like this one we're doing in Traverse City, let's just use as an example, you've been selling about 180 RVs a year. And when we come in, our goal in the first year is between 650 to 800. And we're going to stock and load this dealership to sell that many RVs. 
to the person who's been running it for 20 years, they look at you like you have 10 heads and they, they can't wrap their head around it. And it's hard. What's, what's unfortunate is a lot of them, if they would just get their mind space right, listen and observe what we've done, they could do it. And I know that's true because in some situations, like in our finance office, we'll have someone that runs a certain performance level. We'll bring in somebody else that, that establishes a, a minimum of a level up here while they might be down here. And it's amazing how soon this person rises up because it's like the four minute mile. They see that it can happen. Who you surround yourself with in your career will largely influence you on what you can become. The better people you surround yourself with, the more and more you will grow and develop. They will influence you. Because of who I've been around, I've, I'm an avid reader. I study, I learn as much as I can about different things. And that's because of the people I've been around that shared with me the impact of reading and learning and learning from multiple fields of study. And who you're around will, will ultimately inspire you to what you do. Um, culture is important. And certainly the work-life balance and what you get from that, but you have to make a choice on what is work-life balance, what is, what is the elements of success that you're willing to put in. So I have found a direct correlation, people coming out of college, there's really two buckets that I classify them in. And one of the buckets is I paid my dues, I'm ready to get paid. The other one is I've invested in myself, I've learned how to learn, I've learned how to problem solve, I've learned how to think critically, and I'm ready to apply that towards success in a field. The second of the two buckets is successful in our company. The first one is not. So college in our world opens the door for opportunity. Um, but today, 47, th this is a crazy stat. 27% of college graduates are entering a world by, let me take it back. <laughs> I wrote it down. This is a weird step. What is it? 47. Yeah. So of all the jobs in America, only 27% of them or something like that require a college degree. However, 47 or 43%, I can't remember the exact number. I'll get it for you. But like 43% of Americans are college degreed up. That means there's an, an imbalance. There are far more people capable of jobs than there are jobs for those people. So in our industry, for example, we've taken an industry, RVs, where the majority of people are not college degreed, and we've created a criteria for entry where you got to have a college degree. Why? Because then we can be giants in this industry. We're going to choose people who are bright, capable, talented, have energy and enthusiasm to grow something and grow a business, use their skills to transform an industry. And it works. And it allows opportunity. But when you surround yourself with those type of people and we create a culture, Peter Drucker said it best, culture eats strategy for breakfast. There are a ton of smart people in the world. There's, there's an imbalance, right? More people are capable than there are real jobs for that. Um, Peter Lencioni, he wrote a book called The Advantage. If you haven't read it, it's a great book. Um, but he talks about a company that's smart versus a company that's healthy. And in college, we really learn a lot about being smart. We learn about strategy and marketing and finance and technology. But a company that's healthy, that's a lot harder, a lot harder. A company that's healthy has minimal politics, minimal confusion. There's high morale, high productivity, and low turnover. Smart is becoming a commodity. There are a lot of smart people, healthy people that work together, collaborate and create a culture where you want to be there. That's more rare. As, a, as an individual, think of it on two fronts. Number one, what's the culture I want to be a part of? And do I have that in myself? Is there alignment? So as we interview and as we recruit, we really dig into a person's environment. We want to know what they're like. Because that, that ultimately develops their ability to be successful with us. There are a lot of people that could hit our metrics and could perform and can listen and they could be smart. But if they create confusion and create politics and they, they don't fit into the, the healthy bucket, we, we can't do much with them, right? So 
Culture is an incredibly part, uh, incredibly important part of the business. It's our foundation. It's kind of our bedrock. Um, those are our the big three. And for sake of time, I'm going to jump right into some things. So there's a book called Play Bigger, and they shared a quote that I found fascinating. Kind of goes back to the Google in 2001, right? When you look back at Apple, Google, several other companies, they were founded in the garages of people's homes. And it's fascinating to me. When Nielsen's analyzed 20,000 products, these are mostly, most of these new products introduced in the United States were from big old power, powerhouse companies. Uh, it found out of 20,000 products, only 74 of them, that's less than one half of a percent, actually had sustained success. So what that means is the odds of a company becoming a billion dollar category king are better. Um, the odds of that company becoming, no, nah, this is written wrong. The odds of a brand new startup in the basement garage is far more likely to succeed than a big company. We wrote that wrong. Um, but that's, the, that, that's you right now. So many people are afraid to bet on themselves. Bet on what you can do. Bet on your talents. Why? It's scary. It's the face on our moms when they say, what? Variable? You're going to do this for commission? Don't, can't you go work for the government or something? Like that, that's the look on their face. But the more people, the people that bet on themselves, and I list out my friends, man, I can see the ones that have bet on themselves, they win. But there's an ethic that goes along with it. And there's a real decision making that goes with it. But the stats are in your favor. If you're willing to take a chance, the, the odds are actually in your favor. Um, so in the RV industry, just real quick, and I'm going to open up for questions. I'm not going to get into a lot about Bishes, but I'm going to give you a little bit. I'm not sure if you came to learn what we know about betting on yourself, setting your sights higher, or if you're interested in our opportunity. I'm going to tell you what it is. And I'm going to open it up for questions across the board. Um, but our objective really is, is to help people in America, college students, set your sights higher. Put challenge on, our, on us, on other industries and other companies to, to put more faith in, in the rising generation. Um, we've done it now for a few years, and I couldn't be more proud of the people we have in the company that have come in and put their risk on the line. And we've seen, we've seen them generate results for us that flat out are amazing. And we couldn't have got there without them. And we all benefit. But uh, when people walk into our company, they're like, dang, what's the average age of your people in here? <laughs> they're young. Well, they're young and, and they're, they're out driving the veterans in our industry. Um, in the RV industry, this is the list of shipments. This is how many RVs have been delivered to, um, to, to different dealers across the country. So I'm going to challenge you here. This is $500 on the line. Haley knows the answer. So she'll review it at the end. We'll, we'll tell you who wins. So the person who can give us the first answer closest to the pin, how many RVs, recreational vehicles, that's travel trailers, fifth wheels, class A motorhomes, all of it combined, do you think were sold in America in the last 12 months? Put your answer in the chat. If you win, we're going to send you a $500 Visa card. There were 2,700, there are around approximately 2,744 RV dealers in America. Yet there are, <clears throat> there are 2,464 that are independent ma and pa style dealerships. So when you drive down the road, and now you'll notice them because you talk to somebody that's in the RV industry, you'll be like, oh, hey, an RV dealer. And you'll see it's Jack and Jill's RV dealer, right? They've been doing it since 1966 and little ma and pa industry. We're one of the few industries that hasn't had major consolidation take over. 90% of the dealerships today are, are not consolidated. There is some consolidation. We're one of those. There's a few others. But 60% of the RVs that are sold are, are sold by non-consolidated dealers. So 60% of the unit sales of registrations by people who are buying RVs, those are coming from dealerships that are ripe for consolidation. If you know some math, the answer's in there. Um, go Playbook. This is us as a company, guys. We've taken a lot of time to be intentional about who and what we are. At the core of it, we have a North Star. We want to be in this industry, the place where employees choose to work, customers choose to shop, and our vendors choose to partner. We believe everyone has a choice, and we hope they choose us. 
We have four core pillars, employee development, innovation, customer satisfaction, and profitability built on a foundation of culture. Why, why we show this is that as you're evaluating and looking at opportunities, it's important to understand is their culture, is success defined, and is it intentional? I've been a part of, an, of a company that had a huge growth trajectory, but there was not intentionality behind the direction that they were moving. And it was very, very hard to understand what does success look like. We're owned by Troy Jenkins. He's a majority owner, um, founder of our company, him and his brother. Um, this is cool. He has a degree in animal science. He's our CEO and he has a degree in animal science. Uh, one of the things we think is people limit their opportunities by their career or by their field of study. They get a marketing degree, so they look for jobs that say marketing. Some, some of the most successful CEOs and leaders of companies and organizations have a marketing degree. Some of, uh, some of our, our biggest CEO, he has a degree in animal science. When you go to college, you learn to learn. You learn to problem solve. You learn to think critically. And as you're in that, consider what you can bring to an organization, period. So evaluate, open, open your perspective of audience. Allow yourself to think bigger than just what your degree is. Um, we've had people that go into accounting that have come in. I've seen some of the most successful leadership come from somebody with an accounting degree. And yet sometimes their blinders are on and they just, yeah, I got to find an accounting opportunity. But with that kind of knowledge, a lot, a coupled with some other training and development, you can, you can, you can open up your opportunities. Our real boss is Stacy Jenkins. That's Troy's wife. Um, she's an avid water skier. She's awesome. She's really our culture king, queen. <laughs> she, she leads our culture. She thinks all the time about how do our people feel. We're a family-run company. And um, our goal in this industry is to be a family-run company that can operate and can, and can compete with the big dogs. You can see since 2019 to 2023, and now we have one more to add. You can see the growth of our locations and what we're doing. Um, oh. So the real opportunity in our, in our business is that this, this industry is very fragmented. We've created a leadership program. It's called our Accelerated Management Program. Whether you're an undergraduate, you're getting a master's degree, we have opportunities. We're looking for people who want to lead. And by, in order to lead in our company, there are, there are qualities that you gain in college, right? You learn critical thinking, problem solving, you learn forecasting, maybe demand planning, maybe you got a supply chain degree and you learn for, about procurement and analytics in that regards. Maybe it's analytics, technology, development, product management, maybe you've gone to accounting, whatever. You've learned certain skills that will apply themselves really well. However, learning how to lead people, learning how to understand the business that you're in, how to operate, how to talk to, in our case, we're retail customers, how to really work with the people around you to, to get success. We, our strategy is we bring people in and we put them on the ground floor of our business in a real role, not a rotational, you're going to go learn all these roles and then you're going to lead them. You're going to actually do them and you're going to get an opportunity to be successful in that role and then you're going to grow and you can grow fast and you can become very, very successful really in a pretty quick time frame. But you're going to learn the business. And we teach people the business. And then as they become managers, they're teaching and they're helping mold the generation around them and use their skills that they have to really now manage and lead. Um, it's, a, it's a program that we've used in the industry, several of us, for a number of years. And it works. And we're, we're expanding that. This year, we'll hire 100 people into our, into our program and bring them onto the team. Uh, and we have a lot of different training and development programs. But if it's something that you want to learn more about, we would love to hear from you. Um, so let us know. I hope that what we've shared with you is beneficial. I'm going to sum it up in very simplistic terms. Again, going back to the beginning, we hope that you're inspired. Inspired to chase what you want. Know your big three. Figure out how to find that out in the companies you're looking at and go get it. And income, if it's at the top, don't be afraid of it. Drive towards it. But, but understand the criteria that are going to drive that for you. For me, if someone says, I want to make 200 grand, I say, awesome. Are you willing to do what it takes to make 200 grand? I'll show you a path. Are you willing to do it? And if you're willing to do it and work toward it and show me, because I tie the compensation to your, your inputs. 
It's like it's it's a commission. It's I'm going to pay you at a rate, and as you get bigger and bigger, you're going to get it. We give a comfort zone. It's you know we give a comfort zone. We give a salary. But we try to transition them harder, more and more to variable as their skills and credentials build. And uh, we've had several people come into our company and make six figures within their first 12 months of operation. We've had some that don't. We have some that come in, make 60 grand, and then continue to grow. Uh, but the key is, is we keep them growing on the path that they can come in and grow. So we appreciate your time. Um, are there any questions out there? that anybody has that they want to cover? If so, just throw them into the chat. I'm going to pull that up here so I can see it. Where's it at? Oh, there we go. Still learning technology. Well, we got a lot of good guesses. Do we have a winner there? Hey, Todd, one of the questions in there that is up there a little ways is, are there opportunities in North Carolina? Who asked that? Jessica Brooks. Good question, Jessica. So what's funny about that is I actually, we actually have an employee that works in North Carolina. He does uh, remote parts um, for us. So he's uh, what well, used to be a job in the dealership. We've been able to transfer and, and have him do it remotely. Um, what we look for, we're looking at this point, we don't have a dealership in North Carolina and come in at the entry level. We need you in a dealership. And then that can fold out to several different opportunities as we go. But we've learned that the most success happens is they have the foundational skills of the dealership. So most of the people that join our company are fairly mobile minded. They'll come in, they'll, they'll go to a, a location and then we have a pipeline development. So we actually have skills and criteria that you need to learn and success you need to demonstrate. And as you demonstrate the success, it's objective performance based, not 10 year based. It's performance based. And as you develop and, and show that you've achieved certain performance levels, you then get into a pipeline. And that's the leadership pipeline. You're now a candidate for management. And anybody can, can pull you. And we have leadership development that happens all the while while you're in that pipeline so that you become a more qualified candidate. Um, but several of those opportunities involved now, you there's going to be people from all different dealerships of ours from different locations asking for your support. There are a couple of positions like warranty and parts that have remote options. So as you learn those, if you want to be in North Carolina, that could be a real opportunity. Are there any books that you would recommend, Jose? Yes, actually. Um, if you haven't read From Good to Great by Jim Collins, I'd recommend it. Um, How the Mighty Fall is also written by him. Built to Last is written by him. Jim Collins, I, I think there's a lot of empirical evidence on that. And so it's not, it's not a matter of speculation. They've studied the top companies that have continued and showed enduring growth and success over time and what they do that's, that's consistent. Um, I learned a lot from that book. Um, we love a book called Play Bigger. I mentioned it earlier. Um, it's written, it's a collaborative effort by a group that wrote it. And uh, it's phenomenal. It's about category kings. And one of our pillars is innovation. We're, we intend, we believe that the, the, the way that an RV is bought and serviced today is fundamentally broken. It doesn't line up with customer expectations. And we're on a mission to revolutionize it. We're working on technology and things in the back end that will be released two to three years from now that will completely transform the way an RV gets serviced and purchased. And it's going to be very hard to compete against if people keep doing, the way, doing things the way they are. Um, but that book really inspired us. Um, I could I go on, but I'll, I'll give you um, I'll give you one other that I, that I would highly recommend, and that's the Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. Uh, he's wrote a couple of them, but uh, the Advantage reads more like a textbook. There's another one called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. That's really the same concept in like a like a story format. It's a little easier to read, maybe a little more fun, but. I think he talks about some things, especially around culture that are highly overlooked um, in business today. I think there's a question in there about day-to-day -day and you can kind of touch on how that, we're gonna talk about those in the following info session. Yeah, so what's the day-to-day -day life look like? We're gonna have some info sessions. We're actually gonna bring people who are in our business to you and they can tell you, they know better uh, when you come in exactly what you'll face. Um, 
But I will highlight when you come in, you, you're put into a role, like it's something you agree to, like you know what it is and what it means. You'll know the keys to success. You'll know your compensation plan and what type of variable opportunities available for you so you know what you're chasing. You'll be assigned to have a mentor, somebody that's there to help mold and help you become successful. Part of our development and pipelining growth is in order for you to get into the pipeline um, and to have highest remarks in order to qualify yourself for leadership opportunities, you've had to mentor and develop someone else who's gotten into the pipeline. So the mentor that you're assigned has a very vested interest in your success because in order for them to grow, they need to have people underneath and working with them to grow. Um, so the day-to-day -day activities are different depending on what position you come into. We have supply chain positions. We have um, sales positions. We have operational management positions. We have procurement positions. Um, uh, what else would I miss there? Yeah, and then we have a vendor relations position as well um, that's available at the entry level and then growth spreads from there. Uh, Illinois, close. <laughs> um, Michigan's close to Illinois, right? Uh, but we don't have a dealership in Illinois yet. Um, but we will at some point. And uh, <clears throat> the cool thing is too, if you guys are flexible and willing, if you're interested and you're willing to try out living in another area for a couple of years by just getting your feet wet, we'll have dealerships all over the country. It's going to happen. We're going to start a business, get this in California. We won't even have a dealership for two years and we'll be a full-fledged selling dealership in that market. Um, probably within the next six months. Pretty exciting stuff. Um, Will entry level employees be offered or qualified for benefits provided by the company? Yes. Yeah. So we have full full level benefits that are available, very competitive benefits, uh, matching 401k as well. Um, Oregon, yeah, Adam, we've got a dealership in Eugene area. <laughs> for the accelerated management program, can you talk a little more about sales and service management apprenticeship and how they might differ? Um, so we've actually been tweaking this a little bit. Really, we have a sales path and sales path is going to start more in service. So in parts, really. And we will. So somebody that comes in now, if you want to sell RVs, RVs is a much more commission oriented, a lot more variable nature. We will start people directly in RV sales, but that's a, it's usually a certain type that's like gung ho. I am ready to go and I'm willing to take the risk. There's the most reward there. But if you want to get your, sell, your chops in, you want to learn and figure out what you're capable of in sales, we start in parts and you're still selling, accessorizing an RV, um, helping the customer understand the best ways to accessorize and build up their RV to get the most function out of it while they're camping. Um, and then we've got direct skills that translate and a lot of people come from that and jump into RV sales. On the service side, it's where you get into a lot of our supply chain and logistics You'll get into our operations management, a lot of demand planning, forecasting. Um, it's a lot of process and moving parts and pieces. It's the most transactions. There's the most hands that touch it. And it's the highest collaboration piece of it. Um, in our industry, for a long time, there was a saying that said, sales sells the first RV and service sells the next three. And that's true. Service is is really we sometimes our sales service our sales team like Jake who's on the call tells the service team says hey sales is your number one customer because you have to service all the RVs we sell, but we've we've told Jake he's wrong and said no service is going to be our number one salesperson. We are going to reset the game in service. In our industry, this will blow your mind. The average time it takes to get your RV fixed from the time you bring it in to you take it home. I should offer $500 for this. It's over 70 days if it has warranty work. And on average, it's 46 if it doesn't. 46 days. You bring your RV in. How sick is that? And, and there's a lot of reasons why, but we're tackling them down and we're going to get down to one day. We're gonna, it's going to take one day. You bring it in, we get it fixed. That, that's, that's what we're going to do. And so service is really aligned. If you come in on our service side of the business, we need the bright and the best to come in and help us figure that out, problem solve the solution. And we've got it down to where realistically within the next six months, we believe we can operate at five days, um, which will be game setting or standard setting. Um, okay, I'll take one more question and then we'll close it off. 
Again, I want to thank you guys for your time and um, look forward to it. If you want to continue the, success, the sessions, we're going to lead more. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love your feedback. Um, and furthermore, if you're interested in what we have to offer to learn more, please let us know. We'd love to talk to you. Um, I remember you mentioning the entry-level positions are only in-person dealership positions. How long would you estimate it would take to qualify for a remote position? Um, you know, it kind of depends on the opportunity and when you join the team. So Jen, uh, Jennifer, I'm not sure, you know, what, what undergraduate level, if you're like a senior and graduating or junior or sophomore, but <clears throat> we're going to be transitioning a lot more to remote in warranty and parts um, and centralizing those aspects. Uh, but I, I can't really commit because I, I don't know the answer. Uh, I know there will be more of those opportunities as we go along. Um, and it really is requisite upon the abilities of that person to do what we need them to do. But um, in warranty and parts, which warranty is really our vendor relations management. They manage those relationships and process the service work and the administrative work for all of the work that comes through from customers that need warranty done. And parts is like our procurement specialist. These are people that work with our vendors, streamlining the vendor process, um, looking for and, and expanding our vendor selection. Um, those jobs can all be done remote now. Uh, so, and typically you can become very proficient in those jobs in vendor relations. You can become very proficient in a matter of three to six months. And in, in the procurement, you get better and better as you go, obviously in all of them, but you can be pretty proficient in six to eight months. Well, thank you guys for joining. We appreciate you taking the time. Hope it was valuable for you. If it wasn't, please let us know. We, we love your honest feedback. Take care.